Bill is, is uh, very excited about sharing with us this morning. I asked him what he wanted me to share. He just said, just tell him that I'm very excited to be here. So uh, you, he you hear that, uh, that you, the Chinese proverb that says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Well, I'm not sure where the category of actually helping a man grow fish goes, but I'm, maybe it extends beyond a lifetime. But Bill, we're very excited about you sharing about tilapia uh, and... Uh, Blessings on you. Thank you. This is the, this is the uh, are we on here? Yeah. Wow, this is great. Um, when I came into the room, I was kind of hoping there was a bunch of mirrors on the walls, but I see it's real people everywhere, which is really neat. Um, I want to thank Echo for, for inviting me here. And um, I think one of the interesting things about, you know, putting a talk together or coming to a conference like this is that you start to boil down to the bottom of the pot what it is you really do. You know, what, what gets your feet up in the morning to, to um, what gets you excited and motivated. And um, I look at the efforts that ECHO has done throughout the world, and um, I, the, 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 the word that comes to my mind is ripples. I look at all these people in the room. If everybody in this room takes a little piece of these messages and takes them out to wherever they're going, it's an incredible amount of ripples. Of uh, this malaria thing, there's two things that I dread the most about working in Haiti. One is malaria, I've had it many times, and the other is chiggers. I don't know anybody's ever had chigger bites, but I think that uh, I think the CIA ought to look into it because it's um, it's got to be worse than waterboarding. Anyway, <laughs> when you come up with a, I did try neem by the way, and it um, at least the Haitian chiggers don't. They just, I think they love Neem. But anyway, um, I'm going to talk about our efforts over the last 11 years to develop culturally congruent methods of producing tilapia in Haiti. Now, the word culturally congruent wasn't in our vocabulary when we first set foot in Haiti. We came into Haiti uh, like typical blondes outsider NGO, thinking that we know what's best and this is the way you ought to do it. And I can say to anybody um, who thinks they understand Haiti, including our Haitian friends here, <laughs> uh, any blonde who thinks they understand Haiti probably hasn't been there enough because the more you're there, it's a wonderful, mysterious, loving country, but it is also very confusing. Um, a lot of times the trains of logic that we're used to uh, are really different in a wonderful way. So with that being said, I'm excited to do this. And being excited is not always a good thing. Um, have you ever seen a blind chicken in a, in a big coop? That's sometimes what happens when I get excited about something. So. I have taken my Bach rescue remedy this morning. Everybody familiar with that? It's a botanical that's supposed to take away the chicken part of it. Anyway. <laughs> so we'll get started. Um, why tilapia? Um, this is something that really became apparent to me when I was preparing this talk. Um, you know the old story of the fellow who's on the roof of his house and there's a flood. And the water's coming up and the canoe comes by and says, come in and I'll save you. And he goes, no, God's going to save me. And then a couple of minutes later, the Coast Guard comes by and he says, no, God's going to save me. Long story short, the guy drowns. He gets to heaven and he says to God, he says, how come you didn't save me? He said, I sent a canoe. I sent the Coast Guard. How does this relate to tilapia? Everybody's scratching their head. Um, we've been given a real gift with this fish. And one of the things I want to try to really drive home to everybody is just how unique this fish is and what a wonderful gift it is to, to the planet and, uh, and particularly to areas of developing areas of the world, particularly this latitude um, where so much of our impoverished uh, peoples are on this planet. 
of the warm latitudes. Um, tilapia grows very fast. Uh, it's extremely tolerant. I mean, I've been raising fish for 30, 32 years, and I've never, everything from octopus to salmon to trout to bass, there is nothing that can compare to a tilapia. Uh, short of taking care of a pet rock, they're just about as durable as you can get. I didn't mean to offend anybody that had a pet rock, but <laughs> um, they're very disease resistant um, and they're prolific. Now, the prolific part is good and bad. It's kind of like the fellow that raises rabbits uh, and he said, I had two rabbits once. <laughs> um, this is the way tilapia are. They're very prolific. And they truly are the miracle fish. And this point was driven home to me by a friend in Haiti when they were talking about the parable of the fishes. And he said, God's watch is very slow. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, when Peter took the fish in the basket and fed the multitudes, we assume he put the fish in a basket, walked ashore, and fed everybody. Jesus fed everybody. God's watch is slow. If he took those same fish, put them in a basket, put them in some water, and waited six months, you truly could have fed the multitude. So it's a very, it was a unique way of thinking. There is no fish I know of in this world that can do what tilapia can do. And we're really blessed to have them in Haiti. They're not native to Haiti, but they've been in Haiti for roughly 50 some years. So. That's why I think it's a miracle fish. And um, I'm not going to get into the science of it, but um, you know, people talk about different strains of tilapia which work best in certain areas. I know in, in Haiti we have some areas of the country that really like the red strain. Um, the further up in the mountains you go, the less particular they are about the color. Um, we had a dog once, it was a mutt, and my dad always said it was a, a summer dog. And I said, I, what do you mean it, it's a summer dog? He says, well, it's some of this, it's some of that. Most of the tilapia you see around the world are summer fish. There's some of the nilotica, some of the urea. Uh, the, there's a lot of genetic intermingling amongst them. And this is one of the things that's made tilapia so successful. Uh, they're native to the Sea of Galilee. They're also native to Lake Victoria in Africa. And if anybody knows anything about the adaptive pressures that are put on animals, particularly aquatic animals, Lake Victoria is the marine boot camp for challenging genes. Um, they say that fish and aquatic organisms that evolved in Lake Victoria evolve about 10,000 times faster than Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. So you have an animal here that's been challenged with salt water, fresh water, heat, drought, disease, and it's survived. And this is what we have to work with. This is the gift that we're working with in Haiti. A lot of other fishes can be reared there, but tilapia is, I think there's a reason why tilapia um, were called St. Peter's fish. Some of the tilapia strains have two dots on the sides they say that's where St. Peter grabbed the fish. He must have had dirty fingers because they're still around 2,000 years later. But anyway, um, obstacles. We had a conference a year ago in, um, in New Orleans where we gathered all the best fish experts from all over the world. We had fish farmers from Haiti. We had people from the Minister of Agriculture in Haiti, uh, in Haiti at the meeting. We all knew that aquaculture has got tremendous potential in Haiti, but we wanted to ask the question, why hasn't it succeeded? What are the big hurdles that are uh, pre preventing all this from happening? And there's an awful lot of hurdles. Everybody has some reason why things don't work. Um, a lot of them are very valid. I don't have glasses or binoculars, but I can do it pretty much from memory. Oh, okay. Okay. 
excuse me, excuse me, I'll slow down. Um, one of the biggest obstacles, despite all the, the uh, rhetoric that came up in the meeting, lack of fish feed, lack of infrastructure, uh, lack, lack of training, um, lack of resources in terms of um, uh, you know, transportation, icing, things like this. These are all obstacles that can be overcome. Tilapia, the creativity of the Haitian people and the natural resources that are available in Haiti, we can overcome almost every one of these obstacles. And that's what we're going to do in the next 30 minutes or so. I'm going to try to explain some of the methods to overcome all these obstacles that so many naysayers have put forward. First of all, Haiti has really an ideal climate for fish. Um, you've got two rainy seasons. You've got a lot of good quality water coming out of the air. Um, the topography is a bit challenging, but you do have an incredible amount of sunlight. And one of the wonderful things about tilapia is that they feed very low on the food chain. So they're basically, if you have nutrients and you have sun, you can produce food for tilapia, as opposed to so many other fish that rely on a lot of fish meal, which is really crazy when you think about it. Um, to raise a pound of trout or salmon can take, require up to six pounds of wild caught fish to produce one pound of fish flesh just doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. Tilapia, on the other hand, are not animal protein eaters. They are herbivores, omnivores. So, now, <laughs> this came to me late at night. The best way to understand, to overcome the obstacles with regard to raising tilapia is to understand your fish. And what we tell our friends in Haiti um, and our friends in the United States is, it's the eyes of the farmer that fatten the pig. And some people say, what do I mean? I gotta pluck my eye out and give it to my pig? No, the Haitians understand it very right away. The eyes of the farmer fatten the fish. The fish will tell you what he or she needs if you know what to look for, as opposed to a pet rock. <laughs> OK, um, I don't have a pointer, but the area where we first started working in Haiti is, I can, I can move. Wow. To Jacmel, this road through the mountains here. This is where we first started our work. Just for your information, the, the epicenter of the earthquake was right about, right about there. So, when we arrived in Haiti 11 years ago, we were asked to come down to help out a project um, that was involved with reforestation in Haiti for a long time. Um, the organization was CODEP, and I'm sure a lot of you in this room are familiar with CODEP. CODEP has done a wonderful job reforesting, I think, close to 32,000 acres of Haiti. I might be wrong with that. But if you drive that road from Leogan to Jacmel, you'll see what Haiti should be. I mean, it is beautiful. There's areas when you walk from um, uh, the areas that haven't been reforested by CODEP into the reforested areas, literally, as far as from here to that TV screen, the temperature drops about 15 degrees. It's really amazing. There's snakes, there's birds, there's coffee, there's mangoes. The way CODEP worked was they have a group of 
400 and some Haitian employees. And these employees are paid, uh, I think it's a fraction of the daily minimum wage, to plant trees. And for every tree that they plant, that they get to grow to the size of a man's forearm, they get a point. That's why they protect the trees from goats and things. Now, with these points, these villages can decide as a group what they're going to do with these points. They can purchase concrete. They can purchase tin for a roof of a school. Um, I'm not doing that. What the people at CODEP opted to do with their points was to build fish ponds. Now this was back probably in the late 80s when everybody and their uncle was trying to raise fish. People in America were trying to raise fish in their bathtubs. The omega-3 oil article came out and um, anyway, the idea was good. The idea was good, but it had one fatal flaw. These ponds were designed to be stocked with tilapia that were reared at the Kodap hatchery in Lakeel, and food was to be brought by visitors into 50 pound bags to feed the fish. So Kodap has hundreds of visitors a year, and each visitor was supposed to come with a 50, 50 pound bag of fish food. Well, that was the Achilles heel because just about that time, Aristide had the second coup. You couldn't get in and out of the country. And these ponds basically went fallow. So when we arrived in Haiti, we were confronted with, what do we do with 51 ponds that are built in the mountains that are stocked with fish that aren't growing and people were really upset? And rightfully so. This is what it takes to build a pond. Oh, great. Thank you. This is what it takes to build a typical pond. Um, you can see the concrete has to be poured in one day because it's so hot. Um, it's hard to see, but over on the far right there, these are women carrying water to mix with the concrete. I followed one of these women. It was almost a 45-minute walk to the area where she got the water to bring, there's thousands and thousands of buckets a day hauled to mix this concrete. A lot of human calories, and most importantly, a lot of hope invested in these ponds. Here's the problem. Now, this fellow right here, I can't remember his name, this fellow right here, is saying to us, he said, this is the only flat piece of land I have. My family that lives in this area, we put this pond here and all I have is mosquitoes. This fish is four years old. That fish is probably maybe six years old. I can't even do my laundry in this pond. He was upset. This pond is a six hour walk from the road. All that concrete was carried by hand six hours. So this is where we came in. And tell me if I'm talking too fast, because this is where it starts to get exciting. Um, um, how are we going to feed these fish without asking every blunt that comes into the country to carry a bag of feed on his lap? Or her. We've got to develop a method that can be used by the people in the country, and it's got to be simple, and it's got to work, and it can't require a lot of time, because Haitians don't have a lot of time in their day to be fiddling with some project that will produce a product in six months. So we dropped back and started to reinvigorate a concept that had been used thousands of years ago 
and had been enhanced and perfected in Israel. This is a technique using paraphyton. Uh, paraphyton is the green, slimy stuff that grows on submerged vegetation. Tilapia are designed, engineered to eat paraphyton. If you ever uh, look at a tilapia's mouth, they're, they don't have teeth, but they've got these uh, rake, raker type things where they're actually designed to really just scratch and remove. They could probably remove varnish from this if, they, if you let them eat it. So um, we took this concept. Now, one thing we're really afraid of is introducing a Kennedy into Haiti. Does anybody know what I mean by that? Our Haitian friends, a Kennedy is something that appears to be good and is not good. And it came from JF, <laughs> I have to be careful, I do this talk in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> but a, John Kennedy's administration at one point shipped a lot of oil to Haiti. And it was supposed to be food oil for cooking. It was machine oil. Um, Kennedy also implemented a plan of taking clothes from America and bringing them to Haiti, um, which was really a terrible thing. And it's a whole another story. The, the, the tailoring industry in Haiti basically fell apart overnight with these massive bales of clothes coming in. Anyway, there are people in Haiti that weren't even alive during the Kennedy administration that know what a Kennedy is. We wanted to make sure we weren't introducing a Kennedy into Haiti. So before we tried to implement this technology in Haiti, we tested it. Now we're in New England, so we had to create we had to create a mini Haiti, which is a greenhouse that we kept at a miserable temperature of 100 degrees with lots of lights, and we duplicated the technology they use in Israel, and it worked. Now we're ready to go to Haiti and try to implement it. Now let's take another quick look at what paraphyton is. You, okay, this, the top picture is um, a picture from a pond in Haiti where we take bamboo and we split it lengthwise and string it like dirty socks in the pond. We fertilize the ponds with an in situ compost that the Haitians maintain 50% green matter and 50% brown matter manure. Um, that equates to um, a nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of about six to one, which is what we want. But it's too difficult to try to explain the chemistry of what it is. But 50, 50 browns and greens seems to work. Now, when you get that kind of nutrition in a pond and sun, paraphyton grows fast. Um, paraphyton will grow at the rate of 10, um, 10 to almost a thou over 1,000 grams of paraphyton per unit of surface area. Now, we took some of this paraphyton and analyzed it, and it can be as high as 54% protein. If you look at it under the microscope, it's full of uh, plant materials, zooplankton, rotifers, larval stages of different bugs. If you look at the gut contents of tilapia, it's full of paraphyton. The biggest feed companies in America, Cargill, Purina, everybody is trying to duplicate what is in paraphyton. The amino acid profile is beautiful. God gives it to us. He, you get sun and manure and some mango scraps and you got it. You can tell the blunt on the airplane to leave his, take a bag of mangoes with him. Don't bring feed. Um, anyway, <coughs> excuse me. This is a test, nobody likes graphs, but this is really important. Um, this just, this just shows that fish fed a very high quality American feed will grow just as well as fish being fed just paraphyton. 
And fish feed in Haiti is very, very expensive. It's all imported from America. So now here's one of the problems with the paraphyton technique. Now this is all in Echo Development Notes 105. And we have this translated into Creole also, this whole technique. Um, your stocking densities using this method are very low because it's really difficult to get enough material in the pond to create enough paraphyton. I mean, you really need a lot of substrate. Imagine if you could put a big hairbrush in a pond, that would be the ideal thing to do, but then it becomes an issue to get your fish out and move around the pond. So we stock at a density of two fish per square meter, maintain the compost, and walk away. And what we did was these men and women are animators that work for CODEP. Each one of these men and women is responsible for about 50 other people. So we tried to create the ripple effect, train these people to train the other people, because some of these ponds are hours and hours and hours hikes up into the hills. We trained them, we had a big fish fry, everybody was all excited. Um, now these are people who are soil-based farmers, and now they've got to get creative and figure out a way of creating surface area for paraphyton. This is a, Pastor Duress, no it's not Pastor, anyway. This is a clever idea where they take bamboo and they split it and put a rock in it to increase the surface area. This is a typical pond. Now if you look, just to give you an idea of the, the energy involved with these ponds, on the back side of this pond, right there, if you step off that wall, you fall about 25 feet. These are carved into the sides of the mountains. So what they've done here is they're putting up their bamboo for their paraphyton, um, and they put in some palm branches, and in the corner right here is their compost bin. I don't know why they put it so far away. It's a very dangerous walk to get to it, but... Um, <laughs> so this compost bin will act as a tea bag, slowly releasing nutrients that allows the paraphyton to grow. There was a lot of skeptics. I mean, people are saying, you blondes, you come down here, you tell us to drain our ponds and then fill them up with sticks, and that's going to make our fish grow. And we said, just trust us. <laughs> um, this is Pastor Duress. It's about 98 degrees. He's drinking Haitian coffee, which if anybody's had that before, it's really good. but. <laughs> Okay, now we came for our first harvest. And um, it was a little bit nerve-wracking because these ponds are very green. You can't see in them. They look like pea soup. Well, we drained the pond, one of the first ponds, and lo and behold, six months, we put in fingerlings that were one gram. They're about an inch long. And in six months, this is a madam in S, this is what she harvested. And now she didn't put any work into this pond at all other than maintaining her compost, probably five, 10 minutes a week. Walking down the trail, she would find a, a, a hunk of donkey dung and she would throw it in there and so forth. Um, fairly low, low resource. Madame Ines, on this one harvest, she paid tuition for three students, three of her kids, and bought a bag of rice with that one six-month harvest. Now, as you know, everybody in Haiti has cell phones. So this is Clamont. He's saying, hey, these blondes aren't crazy. This is working. Um, <laughs> it was a little frustrating. We, it was difficult to quantify how well the ponds were doing because the Haitians were so secretive about everything. And I understand why they were secretive. Success can be a little bit dangerous. Um, we couldn't get any data on how well the other ponds were doing. People were harvesting late at night. 
Um, but we did hear rumors that there were ponds being built way up in Guoman. This is an area where we don't even work. So this was our only positive reinforcement we got in this whole project was that we heard other ponds were being built. And it was a little bit sad. We looked, you can see some of these ponds are only, uh, you know, one, one meter square. What was really frustrating is we came back six months later, nobody was raising fish. Everybody had quit except for Madame Ines. She was the only one. The reason why they quit was because these ponds weren't capable of producing enough fish to be divided amongst all the people that owned the pond. Wow. So there was fighting, there was squabbling, and they all just said, forget it. So, important challenge. Ownership is very important. Cooperative ownership is very difficult because you have one or two people do all the work and come harvest day, everybody shows up to get paid. It's a little bit like that, I think, everywhere. So, challenge of ownership. These ponds were simply too big. There's nobody in Haiti owns pieces of land big enough to do what some of these ponds, well, in the areas where we were working, so we had to drop back again and punt. This was really upsetting. This was six years of work. And you drive that road from Leogan to Jacmel, you'll see these ponds sitting there, just breeding mosquitoes. Very frustrating. Each pond cost about six to $8,000 US to make. So, our next step, we've got to increase the production in the ponds. Let's start to look at some of the local botanicals and see what we can do in terms of making a fish feed so we can increase the amount of fish that are produced from the paraphyte. The paraphyte just could not do it in the densities that we needed. So we looked at Caliandra, Lucena, Moringa, interesting thing, when we started, we knew Moringa was gonna be a backbone, a big piece of this diet. When we first started this, we couldn't find Moringa anywhere. Uh, and Google was available then. I think the only Moringa we could find was in a botanical um, archive, a live archive at the New York Botanical Garden. That's the only Moringa we could find. So Rodney and Sharon Babe, who were the missionaries in Haiti at the time, brought through customs in Miami 72 pounds of dried moringa. They got it through customs. It's pretty amazing. What I think is encouraging is to see how much moringa is available now. People are really, I, I wish I knew how to invest in it, but it, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. So this is our plan. Let's formulate a fish feed using these native ingredients. We don't want to pull of Kennedy, so let's make these diets, test them at our lab, and see what we can do. Now, this was very precious work because we're using ingredients that were brought by hand from Haiti to do some statistically valid tests on fish growth. Um, later on this afternoon, I can go over with anybody that's interested, all the ingredients, but um, moringa was a big part of it. Cassava is an excellent binder for making the pellet. Um, some lucena, probably the most important ingredient next to moringa is this edible eutropha, which I don't, I brought some seeds with me. This is another miracle that we've been given. Um, some of you maybe are familiar with it. Eutropha is a poisonous plant. Everybody knows, they call it the physic nut, graveyard tree, black vomit tree. Um, it's very, it yields a seed that's very high in protein. But as you know, anything that's high in protein that's not protected will be eaten. 
that's why Yatrofa has developed a very serious uh, form of, of toxic compounds in it, forable esters, uh, phytates, a bunch of other things. But there is a form of Yatrofa that's non-toxic that was rumored to grow somewhere in Mexico. And a friend of ours who's Haitian, plant geneticist, went to this area of Mexico, found these seeds uh, growing, and brought 500 kilos of this edible eutrophic seed to Haiti. The name of his company is Chibis Energy. Uh, I have it all for you to hand out. Um, this thrives really well in Haiti. Um, according to Gail's predictions, this seed could meet the diesel requirements for the country in terms of the biofuel. It's about 50, can be as high as 50% tank ready biofuel. But the press cake that's left over can be as high as 45 to 50% protein. So this was our backbone for our feed. OK, another fantastic supplemental feed is duckweed. Tilapia love duckweed. And duckweed, depending on the amount of sunlight and the nu nutrients available, can be upwards of 30% protein. Another fantastically local food is papaya leaves. Now, you can see right behind this boy here, there's some, pap there's some papaya leaves put in the pond. I was telling my Haitian friend, Guito, um, I said, you know, your fish will eat papaya leaves. He said, no, they won't do that. I said, they will. So I picked a papaya leaf, and I threw it in the pond. And the fish went crazy eating it. He picked a papaya leaf, and he threw it in the pond, and the fish didn't touch it. <laughs> but, but let me back up. Before he put his papaya leaf in the pond, he said they only ate it because you blonde gave it to him. I said, no, you try it. And he did it, and the fish didn't touch it. So now I'm getting confused. But at some point, the fish must have eaten it because people are doing it. You can raise a lot of fish just on papaya leaves. Now, this is the one I'm really very, very excited about. Black soldier fly larvae. Black soldier fly larvae are incredible converter of vegetable and plant scraps into high protein maggots, larvae. Um, they're capable of converting over 20% of your household scraps into fish food. 100 pounds of rotten mangoes, banana peels, will translate into 20 pounds of fish food. 20 pounds of fish food, if you had to purchase it in Haiti, would cost $11 American. OK. And the neat thing about black soldier fly larvae is they're very clean. When the maggots or the pupae get ready to metamorphosize, they crawl out of the muck, and they actually drop right into the ponds. So there's not a lot of work involved. OK, I'm going to skip through this, but we did put in an aquaculture learning center in Marigo, thinking that if we teach young people how to farm fish, they can carry the message through. Um, we're producing roughly 2,000 pounds every six months. This project failed because the principal of the school, who is very close with the mayor. All the fish were stolen. 